Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Today's video is gonna be on low dopamine symptoms and what you can do about it. Again, dopamine's a neurotransmitter. It plays a big role in focus, in reward, in the brain. Uh, it also helps with energy. Again, low dopamine's gonna cause all kinds of mood issues, maybe even hormonal issues as well. And before we dive in, make sure you smash that like button. It really helps with the search algorithm. Put your comments down below. Let me know if you have any low dopamine symptoms like I just mentioned and, and what you've done to help support that. All right, so let's dive in. So dopamine's a neurotransmitter, right? So it kind of helps the communication in the brain happen. So neurotransmitters are these compounds that exist between a pre and a postsynaptic neuron and it kind of it's a little bridge to get that action potential from the pre to the post neuron and to the compounds in between all right so dopamine's a common neurotransmitter serotonin's the other one right there's things like gaba as well or gaba i should say um gaba or um there's things like um melatonin's more it's kind of a, a a neurotransmitter like compound because melatonin can come from serotonin. Adrenaline's also similar as well because adrenaline also comes from dopamine as well. So some of these compounds, they work together. GABA is much more of an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Uh, beta endorphins kind of one as well. They play a role in cellular communication. And when you're stressed, you're going to burn through dopamine just like your car burns through gasoline when you redline on the gas pedal and dopamine's in a play it can get converted downstream to adrenaline so dopamine can be used for focus reward that feeling of love connection happiness it can also be shunted downstream to deal with stress and help with adrenaline mobilize fuel deal with stress right and so when you're stressed you need that constant bit of adrenaline to fire that fight or flight to fire the sympathetics to mobilize cortisol dopamine is very similar to progesterone right when you get stressed progesterone goes downstream to cortisol to deal with stress and inflammation well, guess what dopamine goes downstream to adrenaline so it kind of it's the alter ego of progesterone if you will and so very, you know, strong connection, right? Women, when they get stressed, their progesterone goes downstream to, to cortisol, which makes their estrogen dominance worse. Then you can have more estrogen dominance symptoms. When you start getting stressed with dopamine, it goes downstream to adrenaline and you can have low dopamine symptoms. That could be focus. That could be energy, mood stuff. It could be um, dealing with stress. All of these things are low dopamine symptoms. It can also throw off your cycle. Low dopamine can also cause a rise in prolactin. And prolactin is this kind of hormone-like compound. And when it gets elevated, your cycle can be thrown off. It can affect ovulation. It can affect FSH and LH signaling down to the ovaries. And it can really create a lot of hormonal imbalances. So we want to be very careful. Dopamine can throw off a lot of issues. So what do we do about it? So first off, look and see where the stress is coming from. Physical, chemical, emotional stress. Where is that stress coming from? Figure it out. Um, number two, work on food. Food is a big role because dopamine is made from tyrosine and phenylalanine, right? These are amino acids. These just come from protein. So if you have a low protein diet, a vegan vegetarian diet, you have poor digestion, right? Not consuming high qualities of protein from good, healthy, organic, free range, pasture fed, organic animal products. All these can create, you know, functional deficiencies, so it plays a big role. If you have an H. pylori infection, low stomach acid, a gut bug, something that's affecting protein digestion, amino acid utilization and absorption, this can really throw off your dopamine. Just being excessively stressed. If you have a lot of physical, chemical, or emotional stressors that are not in check, emotional stress, it could be family issues, relationship issues, money issues, physical issues. It could be you're exercising too hard. You're in chronic pain or stress because you're doing too much CrossFit or you have an injury that's not being addressed or you have up and down blood sugar issues from too much refined carbohydrate or inflammatory gluten or just not having enough good proteins and fats or nutrient dense foods. All of these can play a role. So when you're with a good functional medicine practitioner, they're going to really do a lot of investigation to figure out what stressors are your stressors. What could be driving a lot of your stress? You got to look and see where those issues are coming from. Make sure food's good. Make sure you have a good, solid diet foundation. Now, diet may not be enough to fix it in the end because there's what's called the thermic effect of food. So about 30 to 50% of the energy that you get from protein actually goes into digesting and breaking down the protein. So imagine a transaction fee of 50%. It's a pretty expensive transaction fee, right? You spend 100 bucks, here's a $50 fee to pay for that $100 on your credit card. That's the transaction fee for protein in your body. 
So it's hard to make up for extra protein. So you can eat more protein. We can take HCL and digestive support to work on digesting that. It's great. We can work on cleaning out the gut and make sure there's no impediments to absorbing a lot of these things like H. pylori or blasto or other parasites or yeast or SIBO, to name a few. And we can use specific amino acids to help. We may use things like tyrosine or L-DOPA. We may use extra precursors like B6, which are very important, other B vitamins like B5 and B1 and 2 and 3, right? Thymine, riboflavin, niacin, all very important B vitamins, all activated and methylated. Activated folate, activated methylated B12, very important to help dopamine work uh, appropriately. And we got to fix the stress. I always tell patients, if we just support dopamine, but you're not fixing the underlying issues, it's like throwing gasoline on the fire. It's like snorting Adderall. You're going to feel better for a short period of time, but we're not fixing anything. So I always kind of draw a line like, okay, are we fixing anything on one side? Yes. Okay, good. Then I feel okay supporting on this side because we're making structural changes that are going to prevent us from burning the candle at both ends. So I always say, are we burning the candle at both ends? Yes or no, right? It's like, giving someone a chiropractic adjustment and their posture is terrible all day and they're sedentary and, and they're not willing to do any exercise. Okay, it may be helpful, but it's not fixing root cause stuff. So we wanna make sure we are, we are providing good root cause support. So dopamine is really important. Precursors are gonna be, tyrosines are gonna be a really in, good nutrient we can add in there. We could add in L-DOPA, macunapurines. These are gonna be L-DOPA. It's gonna be uh, better converted. I only do that for patients that need more support. I start out with just the amino acids first. Now, we'll start off with one gram, one to three grams on tyrosine out of the gates. We'll provide some of the extra B vitamins to help those nutrients work well on top of that. Okay, that, that's really important out of the gates. Now, the enzymes that get upregulated when you give dopamine, it's called the aromatic, decarbo uh, aromatic decarboxylase enzymes. These enzymes are going to also metabolize serotonin as well. So when you give lots of dopamine support, you can create some functional deficiencies long-term if you are not giving a little bit of serotonin support. And so I always try to give a little bit, if I'm gonna have someone on it long-term, a little bit of serotonin just to make sure there's no functional deficiencies. It's like part of the um, levodopa, carbidopa, cinnamate drugs that they give for Parkinson's patients, they can create a lot of side effects primarily because of serotonin issues. So we always wanna make sure we're supporting serotonin if it's a long-term thing. Short-term, not a big deal. So we'll provide a dopamine support, very, very important thing. Women also need to look at supporting progesterone because progesterone is a GABA chloride channel opener. So it can really help relax and kind of tone down the sympathetic nervous system. So you wanna, if I'm looking at dopamine with women, I'm also wanting to look at the hormones and make sure estrogen, estrogen dominance, and progesterone is looked at. Also get cortisol looked at because if dopamine's getting low, it's typically going downstream for adrenaline. And if adrenaline's being recruited, well, that means the adrenals and the cortisol and the adrenaline go together. So you always want to connect the dots here. We don't want to ever look at things in isolation. It's okay for the, you know, for the purpose of this video, but long term for your for your own health, you want to connect the dots with your cortisol, good HPA access, rhythm throughout the day with good healthy cortisol rhythm. And if you're a female listening, get your hormones looked at, especially right in the heart of the luteal phase, right around day 20 of your cycle. So really important. So hopefully you're, this is all making sense. Physical, chemical, emotional stress. Look at your diet. Look at your lifestyle. Look at the all the connections that, that play into why your adrenals and your neurotransmitters like dopamine could be stressed. Kind of give you a couple ideas. I start with one to three grams or so on the dopamine side. We add in all the precursor substrates, and then we look upstream to the adrenals and the female hormones as well. And then we cannot forget the gut because that's where all of these amino acids get broken down and absorbed. So again, this is Dr. J here. Hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, click down below, thumbs up, like, description as well for all the other links. If you want to reach out to myself or my colleagues for consultation, functional medicine-wise, we're available worldwide. Let's open it up for your questions here. What is cooking? Wow, ton of questions here already. Let's see what's up here on Facebook first. Dr. J, ooh, I can't answer that question. That is going to get me banned. All right. Let me keep on rolling here. I heard a PhD nurse say that malnutrition in childhood can lead to hypertension in adulthood. Is that true? I mean, yeah, of course, it's definitely, I mean, anytime you are nutritionally deficient, biochemical and hormonal pathways aren't gonna run well. Now, 
it's all gonna be about what's the weak link in you, right? Some people have genetic weak links that may predispose them for cancer or heart disease or dementia or stroke or other conditions or autoimmune issue or ulcerative colitis. So kind of like, is this gonna cause this for you? It, it really depends. Genetic predispositions are gonna really determine what that condition expresses as. Now, of course, if you're gonna be deficient in certain nutrients like magnesium and B vitamins, and you're gonna be stressed and inflamed and your, art your arteries are gonna be more constricted. Yeah, blood pressure is gonna be a hallmark of metabolic syndrome, high levels of insulin, lots of inflammation and, and low nutrients like I mentioned, so for sure. Uh, if schizophrenia is due to an abundance of dopamine, then why is it not an enjoyable experience? Well, I mean, schizophrenia is gonna be connected to lots of other issues. Um, one issue with schizophrenia is going to be gluten sensitivity. So there's an autoimmune kind of component with schizophrenia. Like most conditions that are weird that we don't know a lot about, they're finding this more autoimmune connection with a lot of these conditions as we go along. So think gut permeability, think gluten, think casein, think gut bugs. Love to hear your thoughts on coffee enemas for liver and gallbladder detoxification. I recommend those if you're more sick. Uh, I think it can be helpful. The coffee, you know, rec, you know, coffee enema is going to move your way up to the colon, move up your way to the intestine, hit the gallbladder. It's going to help the liver increase glutathione synthesis. It'll cause a lot of toxins to be released from the liver and gallbladder, which is good. So it's kind of an acute way to wring out the sponge of your liver and expel toxins fast. For most people, it may not be necessary, right? If you have cancer or you have a lot of detoxification issues, it could be a good first step. For most people, just drinking more good clean water, adding some extra sulfur amino acids, methylated B vitamins, maybe adding some binders and sweating a little bit could be enough. So it all depends on where you're at. If you're doing AIP low FODMAP and can't do ashwagandha for stress, is there anything else you recommend? It depends on where you're at. You know, some people will recommend kind of more uppers or more things that kind of push things up on the cortisol side. Some we may go down. And of course, a lot of those like ashwagandha may modulate in the middle. So it depends. I wake up, I break in a sweat like a furnace. I'm doing a monthly carnivore keto for years. I'm on bioidentical hormones. I don't know where the missing link is. I get plenty of rest. So it just depends upon what's driving the hormonal issues. I mean, first thing I would look at is the hormones because that's gonna be one of the biggest things that will drive things like hot flashes. I'd wanna look there first and get some testing done. If I suspect low acid but extra HCL or ACV causes an acid taste in my mouth after eating, does that mean you should go higher with HCL or back off or do more enzymes. Uh, it depends. It, typically, you're going to be looking at burning or irritation or some level of warmness in the tummy. I want to know, like, one-offs don't help me. I like to look at patterns. So are you always having some kind of reflux with all foods? Um, if that's the general trend, I'd want to look at what's going on in the gut from a bacteria issue or an H. pylori issue. But you should have some level of burning or discomfort down low if there's a problem. But I want to know if this is an issue with all foods all the time. One-offs don't help. I always look for patterns. Like I'm very good at helping my patients. I look for patterns. But one-off stuff aren't super helpful. 64-year-old mother had one kidney removed and stopped HRT three years ago. Cholesterol levels increasing. Should we be concerned? I mean, cholesterol by itself is totally worthless for me. You got to look at all the other ratios, particle size, inflammation markers. You really got to look at the whole picture. If not, it's just, it's not very helpful. Okay, good questions. Is it normal to have worse magnesium potassium deficiency symptoms temporarily twitching after starting to get a lot of magnesium potassium in diet? Maybe the body gets an overdrive. Um, not sure. Not sure what you're getting out there. Um, sounds like taking magnesium and potassium makes your symptoms worse. Not sure. Again, diet, inflammation, all that stuff matters. Types of those minerals also matter as well. Do you offer tests to see where one might be with serotonin and dopamine? Oh, yeah. So just to add, how I look at or test for dopamine, we may look at things like homovanilates, a dopamine metabolite. It gets So dopamine gets metabolized into homovanilate. And then it also can go down the vanilmandelate pathway because it can go to adrenaline and adrenaline gets converted to vanilmandelate. So we'll look at homovanilate as a metabolite of dopamine or we'll look at vanilmandelate, which is a marker for adrenaline. And then we can look at 5-hydroxy and doloacetate, which is a marker for serotonin. Those are all good ways to assess what's happening there. Okay, questions. I'm going to try to skip around here to go to the ones that are most relevant. Any tips for optimal methylation? Yeah, Healthy green organic vegetables, healthy organic 
grass-fed, pasture-fed meat, wonderful, good digestion. And then we can also add in some extra methylated precursor B vitamins if we need on top of that. And, and I, I typically test methylation via organic acid testing to look at methylmalonic acid, or we'll look at things like 4-aminoglutamate for B12, or uh, for folate. Methylmalonic acid B12, 4-aminoglutamate for folate. Is it true CrossFit's recommended for men more than women? If so, why? Well, I mean, it just depends. I mean, I think men, obviously, just based on hormones, they have, I think, a 40% increase to build more muscle. Just That's what testosterone does. I mean, women obviously get amazing benefits through healthy level of muscle. Muscle mass does help with progesterone in women, so there's still equal benefits to have it. I just think if you do CrossFit, it's... um. You need some kind of an on-ramp, right? I mean, in the old CrossFit days, there was like, you have to do this amount of reps and you're going to do this am wrap where you do as many reps as possible and you keep going and going and going. And sometimes that's not the best. I mean, I find I much rather do, cycle through two or three movements, rest, and then do it again. because I want my movements to be at the highest quality, best form. I don't like being 10 minutes in and like doing reps of something where I'm so tired and um, at a low level of energy. So I'm not a huge fan of a lot of the AMRAP stuff. I like having better form in what I do. And I think it, that takes a little bit more like, okay, not trying to get, you know, number one on, on the scale, so to speak, or on the charts, you know, but I want to have more quality. And it's hard when there's a lot of competition. So I think that's probably the bigger issue. It's just a lot of competition. And that can affect men or women, I think, equally. I mean, I felt that pressure when I did CrossFit for a bit. That's why I like doing it um, more on my own and, and really having a lot more quality in my reps. Okay, let me keep on rolling here. Left side, chest pain, having a staph infection, and weight is losing. How to gain weight? Can I mean, just gaining more weight, you know, get your macros up, more carbs, um, make sure there's adequate amounts of calories, make sure there's good digestion. But outside of that, need way more information, way more information. Uh, I develop muscle switching because of too much coffee enema. Please replace minerals, green juices, otherwise, in conjunction with coffee enema. Uh, you've been warned. Yes, that's the problem. Uh, with coffee enemas, you can definitely lose a lot of minerals. So you need to really make sure you're drinking really good water, maybe extra celery juice, extra magnesium, potassium, good mineral support. That's one of the downfalls of coffee enemas. It can lower your minerals. You got to be on top of that for sure. And again, if you're working with a good doctor, they should be making those recommendations for you. Good questions. Trying to add an essential amino acid supplement, but to help with energy, what is the best time to take in your opinion? Uh, for amino acids, I mean, if you're doing things that are like more dopamine specific in the morning and afternoon, if it's just amino acid specific, probably any time throughout the day, especially pre or post workout would be great. And things more serotonin based like tryptophan or 5-HTP, probably more nighttime based. Excellent. Glad you enjoyed. Uh, pain beneath the left side of the chest, so this side here. What are the factors suffering from splenomegaly, staph infection? I mean, the left side here could easily be stomach, right? Because the stomach's going to be like kind of right in this area here. So it could be more of a stomach issue. Um, spleen's going to be more down here. Pancreas down here. But, you know, a lot of those organs, they kind of mesh, right? The pancreas and the, and the gallbladder kind of, or the pancreas and the small intestine kind of, fit right in that area too, but probably more of a stomach issue. Again, I like to know more about timing. When does it hurt? What makes it better? But I always look at just inflammatory foods first, and then are we able to break down our food second? Those are all really, really important questions to ask. Let me see if I got any Facebook love here, y'all. Let me see. Got any questions? Let me see what's cooking here. All right. I think I answered everything, guys. Hopefully, you enjoyed today's uh, video. If you did, put your comments down below. Reach out to me if you need. Hope you guys enjoyed everything, and I'll be back later on this week. You guys take care. Bye, y'all.